Last year, we did a couple of series that were so popular that we decided to do kind of a, a, a sequel to, to those, and one of those is called uh, Flannel Graph Heroes. And so we're going to, this series is, is Flannel Graph Heroes, obviously with new material. But if you've been in church for a while, you know what a flannel graph is. You know, this was way before digital media and the smart boards and screens and all of this stuff. And a Sunday school teacher or whatever would use this flannel. How many, how many know what I'm talking about? I'm just curious. Okay, all right. They would use this, this, this board, and sometimes it had stuff on it. Sometimes it was just a black felt board. And they, as they told these Bible stories, they would, they would get these figures that had the, the, the opposite backing on it. And they would just, kind of like Velcro, but not as strong, and just stick these characters up on these boards as they would tell the story to keep the kids engaged. And they would tell the, the, the big stories of the Bible. And if you were in those, you can remember those to this day. It was very low technology, but you remember it, don't you? And so we're going to be doing Flannel Graph Heroes for the next four weeks. And I love this type of series because it's so word-based. And if you know me, that's one of my core values. And it's not really unsimilar to the series we just came out of, The Dreamer, about Joseph. But his story was so big and so many seasons, we took an entire season, I an mean, entire series to talk, yeah, entire season, just about to talk about Joseph. But our character today is actually one of my Favorites. I say that all the time, don't I? But he, he really is. But you've, it's, it's quite possible you've never heard of him. But I think you're going to like his story. There's plenty of action and adventure. As a matter of fact, I, I'm really surprised Hollywood hasn't picked up on this story because there's so much of everything there that would be popular for people to watch. Even some... Uh, for you walking dead people, there's a little bit of gore and guts and stuff like that. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just warning you, okay, it's coming. But the story takes place before there was any king in Israel. Between the time of Joshua and the time of King Saul during the time the Bible calls the judges. And I want to read one scripture to kind of sum up the whole time period, okay? This kind of sums up the whole time period that we're talking about. Judges 17, 6 says, In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. There was no king, and the people did what seemed right in their own eyes. So this is the spiritual backdrop. By the way, does that sound familiar? To you? Come on. Folks, listen. We are living in, like Paul told Timothy, in perilous times. And I'm not, I'm not a prophet person. I'm not a prophetic, you know, the, the signs of this and that, the blood moons and all that. I mean, there's people that really do a great job with that. That's not my strength. That's not my area. But I, I can, I'm not dumb either. I know the word of God, and the signs of the times are there. We live in perilous times, and people are living this way, doing whatever is right in their own eyes. Now, you may be familiar with Samson or Gideon or even Deborah as one of the judges, but our flannel graph hero today is not as famous, but I love his story. His name is Ehud, the left-handed judge, Ehud the left-handed judge. We're going to be in Judges chapter 3. If you want to follow in your Bible, it's going to be on the screen in the New Living Translation. We're going to start with verse 12. It says, once again, everybody say once again. That's important because there's a pattern here. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their sin. Verse 13, Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and Amalekites as allies, and then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. So the first thing we need to understand is that Israel's freedom was taken away from them because they rebelled against God. 
Their freedom was taken from them because they rebelled. In other words, they were being judged. Now, my first point is a tough one, but it's true. Look at the screen. Freedom comes through submission, not isolation. Now, that to some of us is going is to be offensive right off the bat because we've been raised in a culture that freedom comes from doing what you want to do. That's what freedom means in our culture, doesn't it? Leave me alone. Let me decide what is right and true for me. That's what freedom is. The problem with that is it's not biblical. The paradigm that we have been brought up in and the culture that we have been brought up in stands contrary and contradiction to the word of God. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Come on. All right, all right, all right, all right. Here's the deal, though. If you want to be left alone, God will leave you alone. That's what Israel wanted, and he took his hand off. If you want to be left alone to be free, God will do that. I don't recommend it. And if America freedom according to the word of God doesn't mean being left alone, being isolated, doing what you want to do. Freedom in the word of God becomes, it means becoming a servant, a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a paradox, isn't it? It doesn't make any sense to our culture. You become free by becoming a servant? But see, that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. Up is down, left is right, forward is backward, everything is turned upside down. Look at the screen. Kingdom principles turn worldly values upside down. Kingdom principles turn worldly values upside down. And the quicker and the sooner that you and I learn that, the better our lives are going to be. The quicker we understand kingdom principles, the better our lives are going to be. See, Israel was doing their own thing. Israel decided to reject God, and he took his hand off of them, and they were judged, and their freedom was taken from them. Let's find out what happens. Verse 15 But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, everybody say help. The Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, son of Gerar, a left-handed man from the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver this tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. So basically, the tribute money was like a mob payoff. It's all it was. They would send this huge amount of money every month or whenever it was just to keep, make sure that they could stay alive and that King Eglon wouldn't come in and completely wipe them out. But I want you to notice the beginning of the passage. Israel cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord again raised someone up to rescue them. That word again is important because it implies they've been in this boat before. And actually, they're very familiar with this particular vessel. They've been in this thing many times before. It's a pattern. Look at me. It's a pattern. They would rebel. They would be judged. They would cry out to God. They would repent. God would raise up a rescuer. He would rescue them. There would be peace in the land for that generation. But that generation failed to raise up another generation that served the Lord. And it happened all over again. It was a pattern. You may be here this morning and there's a pattern in your life. There's a pattern of you getting in deep. You crying out to God from the bottom of the pit and him pulling you out miraculously, rescuing you, providing people to to lift you up and to help you and to get you connected with him. 
And then you do, and then soon you forget what he's done. And you end up going right back again to what you had done before. It doesn't have to be that way this morning. The pattern can break in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. You believe that? But the amazing thing about God and the amazing thing in this story is that God was faithful to send a rescuer every single time they called out and they repented. So if God would rescue these, these, these stubborn <laughs> Israelites over and over and over again, look at the screen, God will surely hear us when we ask for help. God will surely hear us when we ask for help. But to receive, this is good now, you need to write this down or think about it. To receive his help, you have to humble yourself. You have to come in with your knee bowed before him. You've got to tear down the pride. You've got to ask for forgiveness and confess your sin. And then you have to repent. What does repent mean? Being sorry? It means turning. If this is the way you're going, it's going this way. That's repentance. That's repentance. When we all know 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and here's the part we forget, turn from their wicked ways, then. He's talking to God's people in that verse, not heathens. Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. And then I will answer and heal your land. Everybody look at me. If your family is struggling today, if you are struggling today, ask God for help. Ask God for help. Verse 16. So Ehud made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. Now, don't make any mistake here what's happening. He's preparing for an assassination attempt. He's going to assassinate King Eglon. That's what he's planning to do. Verse 17. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. That's important later. <laughs> after, after delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped care. Wait. All right, that was the most anticlimactic movie I have ever seen. What happened? Wait a minute. What happened to the action scene, guys? What happened to the, the exciting part? What happened to the assassination attempt? He chickened out. Oh, it was planned. But he chickened out. He got scared. When the moment came, he got scared. And he changed his mind. Ooh, how often does that happen in our life? Come on, God put something in your heart to do for him. And you might even take some time to prepare like Ehud did with the dagger and, and, and form it and shape it. Some of us might have even gone to college for it. Oh, my Lord, I'm preaching this morning. <laughs> and then at the last moment, for whatever reason, you, you, you got scared. You became fearful. You changed your mind and you changed your course. And you didn't follow through. And we get scared, don't we? We start overthinking. Can I just can be can we just have some honesty and some some counseling maybe in the in the house today? How many overthinkers do I have in the house? Look around. You're not alone. You're not alone. All the rest of you, please tell us how to stop doing that. No. <laughs> I'm supposed to know. I'm supposed to know. I'm the I'm the pastor. You know what I'm talking about. You take something that's that big. And dear Lord, by the time you're finished with it, 
You, I mean, it's, it's, it's like this little tiny thing, and you, this little tiny stone, maybe, to illustrate it. It's a little tiny thing, and you start overthinking it, and by the time you're done, it's Stone Mountain. <laughs> when you start, it's the, the cup is half full, but by the time you get done, there's not even a cup in sight. Instead of thinking how something can be triumphant and glorious and victorious, all you can think about is how many ways you can fail. My Lord, I'm preaching to myself today. Anybody else? Come on. I don't clap. That's not a place to clap. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. We'll get there. That's more of a place to go, oh, Lord, help me. I may have told this story before. I do that. I tell stories over and over. But some of you are new, so it'll be maybe new to you. But I, when I was a, a kid, six years old, I played all kinds of sports, and I had never played baseball. So I decided I wanted to play little league baseball. So me and Dad went to the sign, rec, rec league. We're not talking about travel ball and all that stuff. We're just rec league, okay? Going to sign up. And we, I get in line, there's a line from, you know, here to the, to the door back there, and plenty of time for a little boy to think, especially this little boy who thinks, who thought and thinks a lot still today. And as I'm in the line, I'm thinking, I've never played baseball. I mean, I've been out in the yard with Dad, and I've, I've played with my friends, and I've, I know, you know, but I've never actually played on a team, Mark. What if I'm terrible? It's a six-year-old. Everybody's terrible. <laughs> I mean, by the time we got halfway, I had completely talked myself out of playing. I grabbed my dad's shirt tail, pulled on it, and said, let's go. I've changed my mind. My dad's a laid-back guy. He's a laid-back guy, and we left. He said, okay. And we left. Had my mom been there, it would have been a totally different story. <laughs> She'd have been like, no, nah, yeah, Totally, but see, the point is, I robbed myself of the joy of playing America's greatest pastime. For how, you know, I'm not, I wasn't going to be in the major leagues. That's not the point. I robbed myself of that, of that time because I was overthinking, overanalyzing, over critiquing my six year old. You said you wanted to go to school. That's right. I didn't want to go to school either. No, I didn't want to go, I still didn't want to go to school. That had nothing to do with it. But listen, when we overthink and we let the enemy control our thoughts and we don't take those captive, we rob ourselves of joy. We rob ourselves of our calling and our purpose. But listen to what happens, and I'm praying what happens to us today. Verse 19, but when Ehud reached the stone idols... Near Gilgal, everybody read it with me, he turned back. Say it again. He turned back. Say it again. He turned back. What happened? What happened? Why did he turn back? What clicked in his mind that suddenly he was willing to turn back, face his enemy, and face potential death for what he was about to do? I'll tell you. I believe he looked up at those stone idols. And he remembered what was at stake. His wife, his kids, his family, his friends, his country, his honor, and biggest, the name of God, Jehovah, being honored. All of that was at stake. And when he saw those stone idols, it reminded him of what was really at stake, that it was bigger than him. And that he had to put his life on the line because, see, those stone idols represented an outside alien influence in his life and in his family that would threaten to tear up everything that he loved. And he deemed it, 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 it he had to turn back. He had to go back. He had to go back. Amen. He remembered what was at stake. First, let's continue the story. He came to Eglon and he said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet. And he sent them all out of the room. Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. As, as King Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger, strapped to his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. There we go. 
Verse 22, the dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger and the king's bowels emptied. Y'all didn't even know. Y'all didn't have a clue that was in the Bible, did you? Y'all need to pick this thing up every now and then. Do this. Read this thing. It's exciting. It's as good as anything out there. Verse 23. Then Ehud closed and locked the doors and escaped down the latrine, the toilet. He escaped. Now, it wasn't a toilet like we have toilets. You understand that, right? This is ancient Israel. It was a hole with you know what. It, when, I'm, when I was studying this, it reminded me of the great scene from Shawshank Redemption. Andy Dufresne escaping from prison. Watch this. Watch this. yards. That's the length of five football fields. Just shy of half a mile. Listen, listen, listen. If you are living in bondage to anything this morning, alcohol, drugs, painkillers, cigarettes, profanity, lying, cheating, gossip, pornography, anything. Listen, look at the screen. You may have to crawl through some stuff to get there, but if you want it bad enough, God can set you free. Come on. You may have to crawl through some stuff to get there. But if you want it bad enough, God will set you free. Look at verse 24. After Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. They thought he might have been using the latrine in the room. It was being used, just not by him. But when the king didn't come out after a long delay, they became concerned and got a key. And when they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. Verse 26, while the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped, passing the stone idols. You think it was coincidence that they put that in there again? When he escaped, he passed the stone idols on his way to Sarai. <laughs> Folks, I'm a, I'm a visual person, as you can see. I'm a visual. I can just imagine Ehud. I can just see him in my mind as he's running past those stone idols and he's covered from head to toe in you know what. He is running and I can just see him give a big grin and he maybe he used a, a finger that, I don't know. I don't know what he did. I wasn't there. Come on. But I can just see it as he ran by those idols. Can you, can you just see it? Verse 27. When he arrived at the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded an alarm, and then he took a band of Israelites down from the hills. Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him. Folks, this thing wasn't over yet. 
This wasn't over yet. I don't even think he even changed clothes. I don't even think he even jumped in a lake and washed off or anything. Look at the screen. When God gives you a victory, take advantage of the momentum. Come on. When God gives you a victory, don't let up. Don't take your foot off the enemy for one second. You continue on. Don't stop until the battle is won. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Momentum is a powerful thing. And one victory, one taste of victory may be all you need to finish the war and to fight again. Don't give up on that momentum. Don't. I think about David and Goliath, a story we all know. He went out to face Goliath, and you know the story. He hit the Goliath with the rock, and that, all that did was knock him over out cold. He wasn't dead. If he had walked away then, it would have been a great victory, but Goliath would have gotten back up, and he would have had to, oh, my God, I'm preaching. He would have had to face him again. That's what happens all too often with us. We get a little victory in our life, but we stop there. We don't finish the battle. We don't kill whatever that thing is in our life. We take a step back. We turn around. We put our back to it, and it gets up, and it haunts us again, and it stalks us again, and it causes problems in our life again and again and again. What I'm trying to tell you today is that when God gives you a victory, don't stop until you run over and take the sword of that thing and cut off the head. Come on, somebody. Don't stop until the battle is won. When God gives you that victory, don't stop. Don't stop. Look at this screen. And the Israelites took control of the shallow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. None of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel, not Ehud, by Israel, things have shifted. And there was peace in the land for 80 years. 80? Anybody like peace in your life for 80 years? That would pretty much put us over the, wouldn't it? That'd get us through. <laughs> Woo. Israel's great victory can be traced back to one man's desire to risk his life for something bigger than himself to risk his life for freedom. Last weekend, we celebrated Memorial Day. We celebrated the men and the women who were courageous enough to go into battle for you and me and pay the ultimate price. If you think about it, we risk our lives every day for certain freedoms. When I was studying this, one that came to mind was simply driving a car. Statistics reveal that there are over 5 million car accidents a year. And out of those, 49,000 are fatalities. But I looked out in the parking lot before I came in today. There's a lot of cars out there. Just about every one of us drove a car to get here. All of us probably have been touched by an accident, a tragedy in our families, in our, in our circle of influence, or maybe a co-worker, someone who was killed, changed our world or life forever, and yet you didn't stop driving, did you? You may have been in an accident that nearly took you out or almost in one, but you didn't lay down your keys. Why? Because that freedom means so much to you. You have deemed it worth the risk. Worth the risk. Well, if we're willing to risk our lives daily for something as eternally insignificant as driving an automobile, what are we willing to risk for Jesus Christ? What are we willing to do to be completely free of everything that would hold us back, weigh us down, and keep us from our purpose? Ehud risked his life for the sake of freedom. When he passed those stone idols, he had chickened out the first time, but when he passed those stone idols, it reminded him what was at stake. 
it reminded him of the foreign influence in his life, in his family, that had to go, had to go, had to go. What are the stone idols in your life? What are the foreign influences in your family that have to go, that you've got to risk everything to make sure those things are gone? And when, he, when Ehud was successful in taking out the king, that small victory, that small victory, that assassination, fueled his resolve to finish the fight and led Israel to victory. The big idea is very simple. There's too much at stake for you to give up now. There is too much at stake. Look at me, look at me, look at me, everybody. There's too much at stake for you to give up now. There's too much at stake for you to throw in the towel now. Okay. There's too much at stake to give up on your marriage. There's too much at stake to give up on those relationships that are important in your life. There's too much at stake to give up on your calling. There's too much at stake to give up on your purpose. There's too much at stake to give up on your kids, on your son or your daughter. There's too much at stake. There's a world out there that desperately needs a body of Christ full of strong people who are connected to their God-given purpose, who are walking by faith and not by sight. There's too much at stake to give up now. I'm praying we have an Ehud experience this morning. That when we're tempted to run from our problems, from our issues, from our addictions, from our insecurities, from our fears, that the Holy Spirit would stop us in our tracks and would respond. We would respond to that in his voice, in his direction. The best thing that you can do for your family, for you, even for this community, is to risk everything for the king. <laughs> to bow your knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. To quit embracing the lie that freedom comes from doing your own thing. That freedom comes from isolation and embrace the word of God that says no freedom comes through Jesus Christ freedom comes through following Jesus Christ and bowing your knee to him letting him run your life and rule your life hallelujah hallelujah today we're gonna pray for courage because courage is what it takes to go into battle courage is what it takes to face our fears Courage is what it takes to overcome overthinking. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of laying in bed and thinking about what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. Well, what if God comes through? What if God gives us a victory? How about think on those things? Think on whatever is good and whatever is pure. That's what we need to be thinking about, not how many ways we can fail. So let's pray for courage to face those things and face our past failures so that we can be everything that God has called us to be. There's too much at stake for anything else. One taste of victory was all he needed. One taste of victory was all he needed to fuel the rest of the fight. One victory. Say one victory. Oh, that was terrible. One victory. Say it again. One more time. One vi what would one victory do in your life? What would one victory do in your family? It would make all the difference, wouldn't it? Because it would give you that momentum. And you could ride on that and... Let God work in your life and heal your life and give you freedom. One victory, one victory. Bow your heads.